Could you hear me now? Okay. No? Okay. So, well, okay. So, what I was saying also for the online people is that somehow the old paradigm in mathematical finance and many other areas of science and engineering is that you are given a model, you assume that this is the correct model, and then you have to do your computations based on this assumption that you have a, a correct description of reality. And the new paradigm is that you are not given the model and then, well, you still have to say something about the quantities of interest like option prices or hedging strategies. And then, of course, what you can do is, uh, well, you can compute and bounce, for example, on the option prices or on the quantities that you are interested in. Okay, and then, uh, so this talk will somehow evolve in this framework of not knowing the model and then trying to say something about quantities of interest. Now, uh, there are many ways in which uh, you can assume that you don't know the model. So let, let's try to discuss this a little bit. So let me put up here uh, the model-specific world. Let's say the world where you have one model that you know, it, you assume it is correct, and you have estimated the parameters, and now you have to do your computations. And we can put up here the model-free world where you don't know anything and you just observe the data. So uh, well, I think this, this model-free is becoming a little bit old by now. You now have to call it data-driven, and then you are more modern. You do the same thing, but you are more modern. Now. I mean, philosophically, at least you can move from, from the model free to the model specific world by, you know, having more information. Uh, in theory, in the limit, if you have enough information, you should be able to identify the correct model. So one way to do the, this, this type of business is you could start from here, assume that you have more information and try to end up somewhere there. And you can also do it the other way around. So you can assume that you have a model. But then, uh, well, you can add uh, some sort of uncertainty in your model, and then you are going in that direction. Okay, so the first half of the talk will involve a little bit in this, uh, in this framework when there is some uncertainty. So you, you assume that you know something and you don't know something else, and you try to manage this. And then for, for uncertainty, there are many ways in which we can be uncertain. So you can assume that, well, you have the correct model, it's, let's say, diffusion, but then you don't know exactly the parameters, so you have parameter uncertainty. Or you can assume that, well, you know it is a diffusion, but then you also don't know the shape of this diffusion, so you have some sort of model uncertainty. Or you can assume that, well, you don't even know if it is a diffusion or not, so you can have, uh, like, uh, um, you know, uncertainty in the probability measure. So this, uh, the robust finance uh, literature would fit somewhere here. Okay, and what we are going to do is uh, somewhere in between here and there. So you will see we assume that we know something, and then we want to say something else about the rest. Okay, so let's start with a simple example. So trying to go in the essence of the talk, uh, I assume that we are having two dices. We are all in the dices, and we are interested in the distribution of the sum. So, well, uh, this looks obviously as a simple exercise. And then uh, if you assume that the dices are independent, then it is a really simple exercise for you know, high school students or something. Right? So uh, if I pose the problem to somebody, the first visual image is that, you know, you have the two dices, they are really independent, so you roll them and then you compute. But then, uh, you know, we don't really know the distribution between the sum, right? You don't know if I'm... Uh, some sort of gambler, and I know how to fix the dices and produce other outcomes. So we have to take all the different possible outcomes into account, and there are many, right? So you can assume that, for example, the dices are, are comonotonic in the language of, of dependent structures, and then they will always bring the same outcome, and then the, the sum is distributed uniformly on two, four, six, et cetera. Uh, you can assume that they are counter monotonic, so they always bring uh, you know, the, the inverse image with respect to the faces of the dice, and then uh, the distribution of the sum is a point mass at seven. And then you can, you know, you can leave your imagination producing different types of outcomes. Okay. Uh, so the message here is uh, you are in a setting where you know the marginal distributions. You assume that you have two fair dices that are you know, uniformly distributed, but then you don't know the, the dependence between the dices. Okay, and this is what in the literature is called dependence uncertainty, the framework where you know the marginal distributions and you don't know anything about the dependent structure. Okay, so uh, in this talk we are going to do, you know, we are going to work in the same framework, but now with uh, with random variables. So we assume that x1 up to xd uh, 
uh, is a d-dimensional random vector. We start by assuming that we know the marginal distributions. They are given by f1 up to ft. And then, well, by classical theory, the dependent structure is determined either by the joint distribution or by the copula. And by Sklar's theorem, we know that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the marginal distributions and the copula. Okay. Uh, so we are still in the setting of dependence uncertainty. And now what we want to say, compute is uh, the main question of this talk will be something like the following. Now, assume that you have some nice function and you would like to compute the upper and lower bound on, on this type of quantities with respect to all copula, so with respect to all possible distribution, uh, all possible joint distributions. And this, uh, so this thing here should mean... Uh, well, this would be the expectation of this random vector, which is um, somehow passed through this, uh, this function f. So you are interested in the f of the random vector x. Then you want to take the expectation of this quantity. So this would be something like the integral of f uh, with respect to, well, either the probability measure or with respect to the copula. Okay, this is what this notation means here. Okay, so you would like to know uh, upper and lower bounds in this expectation with respect to the to this uh, the, the whole class of copulas. Okay, so this is a this is a rather classical problem in independence modeling. It was uh, I think the first formulation is uh, due to Kolmogorov around the, the 70s. And then the first solution in, in dimension two for functions that are super modular, it appeared by Makarov and Rusendorf in the early 80s. And then uh, there were some more uh, developments in the, I mean, the same results were reproved by Schweitzer and Nelson a few years later. Um, so this problem was recently reformulated under additional uh, constraints by Peter Pankov. So what Peter Pankov said is, I want to compute upper and lower bounds on this quantity with respect to all different copulas, but now I want to add some more information in the copula. So I don't assume that I have, uh, you know, that I'm completely agnostic about the copula, but I have some partial information about this object. Okay, and then Tankov produced a complete uh, solution for this result in dimension two, but then there was nothing for several years in any higher dimension. Okay, and okay, Tankov was not the, the only person working on this. He was the person who solved it using copulas. Uh, there is a long line of literature which is mostly independent of each other in, in mathematical finance, where people are trying to compute the bounds on option prices using using all sorts of tools. So Hobbes and Lawrence Fung, they were mostly using tools from probability theory. Uh, Aspremon was using results from uh, operations research and so on. And then there is a second line of research where people are doing, uh, well, essentially bounds on value at risk and uh, different types of risk measures, which is uh, people like Carol Bernard, Paul Lemberts, and so on. Okay. So now uh, the talk is essentially divided in three parts. So we will start by uh, results using copulas, and this is uh, mostly joint work with my former student, Ivo Lux. So the starting point is the following. Um, I mean, for, from the classical theory, we know that we have uh, bounds on copulas, and these are given by the so-called uh, pressure hefting bounds. So we know that if we have Q, which is either a copula or a quasi-copula, then we can bound it above by this quantity, which is known as the co-monotonicity copula and below by this quantity, which is known as the counter-monotonicity copula. And we even know something more. We know that the upper bound is a copula for any dimensions, and the lower bound is a copula only in dimension two. But then Rusendorf at some point proved that it is at least point-wise sharp. So for every u, you can find the copula, which is equal to the infimum of, uh, so the infimum of this quantity is equal to this. Mm, okay. So if it is not clear to people why uh, the two dimension is easy and the three is not working, so just think about the following. So in two dimensions, it is clear what it means to be co-monotonic. So everything should, be both, should go in the same direction. So everything is either growing and then you have concentration here or there. 
And then again, counter monotonic is also easy. So you have concentration either here or there. Okay, one going up, the other going down. Now, if I add an extra dimension, uh, then co-monotonicity is still simple because everything will grow together or everything, you know, you know, grow positively or grow negatively together. Um, but then counter monotonicity is not so trivial because, uh, well, you know, in the three dimensions, counter monotonicity is that the first and second uh, grow and the third drops, or that to, it's not clear, right? It is not clear in which direction you should go now in this hypercube. Okay, and at least my uh, intuitive understanding why it is uh, difficult is just, you know, trying to visualize that it is not easy to define counter monotonicity in three dimensions. Okay, so this, uh, these are the classical results where you assume that you don't know anything about the joint, uh, the joint distribution or the copula. But if you think in terms of mathematical finance, you have at least some, uh, let's say, some multi-asset derivatives that are traded. So they contain some information and you would like to take advantage of this information. Okay, so the way to take, uh, one way to take advantage of this information is to somehow um, put them in the fresh everything bounds in some form or the other. Okay, and there are different ways to take uh, additional information into account. The first way is the following. So if you assume that uh, uh, this is the domain of definition of the copula, you can assume that there exists some set here. Uh, let's call this S. And now for every point in S, you know the value of the copula. Okay. So this is one condition, right? So now you are looking into the set of copulas where for every point in S, you know the value of S and it is given by this Q star of X. Okay, and then you would like to define uh, bounds on all the copulas that lie in this set. And then if you do the math, which is uh, actually not very difficult, you will see that you get uh, this lower bound, which basically contains uh, uh, the counter monotonicity bound from the previous slide, plus the additional information you get from your data. Okay, additional information you get from the set S, and the same for the upper bound. You get uh, the co monotonicity bound plus the additional information you get from your um, from your data. Okay, so one way, one type of information you can encode is to assume that. Uh, for certain uh, points in your domain, you know the value of the copula, and then you you derive some improved bounds. Uh, there are other types of information you can take into account. So you can uh, look into the set of all copulas where, for some uh, for some function, let's call it rho, the outcome of the function is some some given number theta. Okay, so you can look at, for example, at all the copulas with a given correlation. Uh, you can think that rho is uh, some measure of association, or you can think that rho is an option price. Okay, and then you are looking at all the copulas such that a known option price is correctly reproduced by your uh, by your model by this set. Okay, so this is one type of information. Uh, second type of information is that you can encode uh, information from lower dimensional marginals to higher dimensional marginals. So uh, in mathematical finance, if you have, uh, let's say you want to get bounds in a basket with 10 names, and then you have information from options on, uh, on let's say, the th two and three basket options on two and three assets, you can lift all this information to the, two di to the 10 dimensional space. This is what we are meaning here. And finally, uh, Okay, so up to now, we are going from the direction of model three, and we are adding some information heading towards something more model specific. We can also go in the other way, okay, and say that, uh, well, we have used our data. From our data, we have estimated the copula, which we call C star. This is our reference copula. And now we want to look at all, at all the copulas that lie uh, some distance delta according to some uh, statistical distance from the reference copula. Okay, so you look at all the set of copulas that are somehow around your uh, your reference copula. Okay, so there are different types of information that you can encode, and then you get uh, you get typically sharper bounds 
decode the copies. Now, um, uh, how could you do this? Uh, how could you make this work? So, we have here the sets of copulas and the parcel order on the sets of copulas. We have found upper and lower bounds using some additional information. And then, well, if this, uh, if this improved bounds were also copulas, then our job would be very easy. Because for copulas, we have an integration theory. We have comparison results, so we would be able to conclude uh, easily that uh, you know, the lower bound on this, uh, on this quantity with respect to the additional information we have is just evaluating the integral at this lower bound. The problem is, uh, the problem is that the, the, you know, the improved bounds that we are getting, they are typical, well, they are almost never copulas apart from, uh, from the generic cases. Okay, they are what is known as a quasi copula, and this is a strange object. This is not a probability measure, and if you look at the properties, it is a, it, it is a little funny mathematical object. Uh, the problem you have in particular is that you cannot integrate with respect to this thing since it is not a part it is it is not a probability measure it's not even a sign measure okay so integration with respect to this thing is typically not possible so you have to define the integral in some different way uh, you have to prove uh, comparison results so that if you have an ordering of the copulas you have an ordering of, of whatever you have defined here and then you would be able to conclude something like that. Okay, so what we are going to conclude is actually that this is a lower bound of this infimum and then an upper bound for the supreme. Okay, so how does uh, how can you define uh, how can you define now this integral where the idea is obviously not uh, is not uh, fantastic or novel? The idea is that well, you have this integral of f with respect to c, and you are going to do an integration by parts and write here. Um, some functions, a star or whatever, and you are going to integrate with a measure which is uh, which is stemming from this function. Okay, so if this function is nice enough so that it gives rise to to a measure, then you can do integration by parts, and then you can define the integral like that. Okay, and then you can show that this definition is consistent with what you get here in case you have a copula. Okay, so obviously the the difficult part is to make sense of what happens in, in the lower dimensional margins. Okay, so this, this requires some careful bookkeeping, otherwise, it is not something special. Okay, and then okay, the nice functions or like a class of nice functions are those that are called delta monotonic or delta antitonic. The delta antitonic, they are uh, well, if you look at the partial derivatives, the signs are changing from dimension to dimension. The monotonic, they always have the same sign. So in the classical literature for copulas, uh, there are comparison results of this type. So if you have a function delta, which is delta antitonic, and you have copulas which are ordered, then the expectations are also ordered. And what we proved with the boy is uh, something analogous, right? That if you have a function which is delta antitonic, this function will give rise uh, will give rise to a measure here. You will define the integral with respect to this measure, and then you get comparison results of this type. So if the copulas are ordered, then their, their expectations are also ordered. Okay, and then you can take this and do some compute, for example, model free bounds for option prices. Okay, so this would work as follows. So we know that the price of an, uh, let's say, of a multi asset option in mathematical finance. Would be defined by this expectation. Uh, this you can map to this uh, to the operator we defined before. You can consider sets of uh, you can consider the set pi which contains all this object with respect to all copulas, and this contains this object with respect to this restricted class of copulas. And then you can prove. Uh, uh, ordering results of the following type that the price of the derivative will lie between uh, uh, this object here, so the, the expectation operator evaluated at the upper fresher hefting bound, and this will be then be dominated by this, the expectation operator at the common tonicity copula, and then the same for the lower bound. Okay, and in general, the results are not sharp. Okay, in general, the results are not sharp unless you have some, uh, some rather strong conditions on, uh, on what is the function name. They are not unrealistic, but they are rather strong.
Okay. Uh, so one numerical result would look uh, as follows. A numerical experiment looks as follows. We assume that we have, have three assets. We model each of these assets according to the Black Souls model, so normally distributed in our case. And we assume that we can observe the market prices of single asset options, so we know the marginals. And we also assume that we can observe the market prices of bivariate options for its, uh, you know, for its two tuples of, of assets. So we have the prices for this type of derivatives, and then we are interested in we are interested in computing bounds for uh, uh, for a digital option that involves all three assets. Okay, and these are how the numerical results look like. So. So what I mean here by observing the market prices is that uh, uh, we will assume that uh, uh, the pairwise uh, the pairwise joint distribution is uh, is given by a copula, like a normal copula. We are going to generate market prices and then we throw the model away. We just keep the market prices and then we go and do computation using just the market prices. Okay, and this is the outcomes in two. Cases in the on the left picture, the correlation between everything is uh, set to 0 0.3, and on the other side, it is varying according to these numbers. And what you see is the black line is uh, is the reference price, what you would get if you if you knew everything about the model. Then these continuous lines are the upper are prices based on the upper and lower uh, improved bounds, and then the dust lines are what you get from the classical Trecher-Hefner bounds. Okay, and then here is just for the second set of uh, examples. Okay, so the the message here is that obviously, you know, if you if you have information in the market and you take them into account, then you get sharper bounds. Yes, Christian. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, I don't see how yeah. okay. oh, sure. That's a good question. Well, I mean, these are all normal distributions. So I think if you know the correlation, then you know everything. Yes. No, but we do exactly what you said, right? We we generate prices by assuming some correlation. We keep the prices, and then we throw all the other information away. Then we assume that we don't know how were they generated. OK. Can I also ask a question? Yes. Uh, on, the, on the plot that you showed, just for um, understanding why why do these edges uh, turn up in this uh, improved lower bounds? Why are they not smooth at that? Uh, you mean this one? Yeah. Oh. Or is there no? Uh, I mean, on the. Uh, I mean, on the edges are the points where you have uh, you have data. Ah, okay. Right? So you assume that you know the prices for strike four six. Um, I don't remember if it was uh, for every point or for every second, but I think where you have a corner is the place where you have data also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, uh, I mean, other things you can do from uh, from this type of, of results is you can use uh, you can use the same philosophy for computing model-free bounds on value at risk. So using either statistical distances or assuming uh, some extreme value information. Uh, you know, that are enforcing your bounds. What is interesting here is that uh, the bounds are actually improving as, uh, you know, as the, the percentage of the value at risk is tending towards one. So what you are typically observing in this type of results is that, uh, well, let's say for the 95% value at risk, you can get very, you know, very tight bounds. And then as you go towards 99 or even higher, then uh, the bounds are spreading out. And then, of course, uh, you know, 
Nobody cares about the 95% value at risk. Everybody cares about the 95, 99 and further. So, you know, you have something which is not working where it is actually needed to work. And if you use uh, extreme value information, then uh, you have this, uh, this outcome that the bonds are actually improving, which, which is not uh, surprising if you think about this, because you really care about what happens at the extremes. And then uh, a, fun, a funny application is that you can detect arbitrage opportunities using this improved fresh heft inbound. So you can somehow you can encode option prices of, of multi asset options in, in the bounds. And then, uh, yeah, and then if you are given a new option price, you can somehow say if this is uh, arbitrage free or not. The most funny outcome of what happens to this case is that. You can consider financial markets where if you take all the assets and one multi-asset option, then this is traded within its uh, no arbitrage bounds. And then if you put uh, two of them together, then you get arbitrage because, uh, well, there are, uh, let's say, there are martingale measures which are not martingale measures for both. So this is, uh, this is a funny outcome of these results. Okay, what are the not nice outcomes of this uh, theory are the following. So first of all, I mean, the important for application is that uh, the nice functions are delta antitonic or delta monotonic. So you can find a lot of functions that uh, fall within this class. But then if you check for, for basket options, they don't belong to this class. So you have a very nice theory producing nice results and tight bounds and so on. But then the most liquid products are not included in your theory. So, you know, well, thank you very much, but you are not really helpful. On the mathematical side, I mean, Tankov and then uh, Bernard and her co-authors, they could prove that, uh, that in two dimensions, they improved fresh heft bounds. They are uh, actually copulous under, uh, under certain conditions, under certain monotonicity conditions on the additional information. And with Thibault, we proved that for anything strictly data than two, they are almost never, uh, they are almost never copulous. So there was an open question of uh, point-wise sharpness. So, can we find, uh, are these results point by sharp or not? Um, we didn't know and we were not able to answer with, with copula tools. And uh, finally, you know, thinking about also the first slide of, you know, being uh, model free or data driven or coming from some model, we always assume that the marginals are known, but is this some realistic assumption? Well, obviously not. And if we agree that it is not realistic, what can we do about this? Okay, and this is now the second part of the talk, which was joint work with Daniel Bartle, Michel Coupe, Thibault Lux, and Stefan Eckstein, and where we use some ideas from optimal transport in this, uh, for these problems. Okay, so now let us revisit the classical optimal transport problem. So again, we have our, uh, we have our uh, financial assets, we have the payoff, and we are interested in bounds on, 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 this, uh, on this quantity. And if you think about the classical optimal transport literature, the, what you assume is that you have some uh, one-dimensional functions which are bounded and measurable. And nice enough, you can think about put options. Uh, you assume that you know the marginal distributions, and then the unknown is a joint distribution, and the classical uh, transport duality looks as follows. So if you take the supremum, of uh, integrals of this type with respect to all probability measures with known marginals and unknown joint law, uh, you can show that this is equal to the infimum of, uh, of this, uh, the sum of this one dimensional integrals where the functions f1 up to ft, they are dominating your, uh, your unknown, your payoff function f. Okay, so it is easy to see that there is a, there is a link between the classical uh, Frechet hefting bounds where you know uh, the marginals, you don't know the, the copula, and this is the transport result. Okay, so uh, in our first result in, uh, in improved bounds, what we assumed is that you know uh, the value of the copula at some point in the domain. And now, okay, the question is how does this translate in, uh, in the framework here? Well, it translates as follows. So, uh, well, if you take a point in this, uh, uh, in this uh, domain S, Knowing the copula is equivalent to saying that you know what is the measure assigned uh, assigned to this uh, uh, to this domain here. Okay, 
So what we are bringing, uh, so what we can carry over from the previous uh, part to here is uh, that there exist uh, that there exist boxes of this type. There exist boxes of this type. Let's call them now AI. And now we know the measure assigned by the joint distribution mu to this uh, to this box. So in mathematical finance language, we know that uh, the price of this multi-asset digital option. Okay, and now, um, so on this side, we have some additional information on the joint distribution. On that side, we have known prices, which are these uh, PIs, and then we have some investment amounts which are invested in this multi-asset digital options. Okay, and now we can try to, let's say, to enrich the uh, transport, uh, the optimal transport duality by taking this additional information into account. So. On, on the left-hand side, on this hand side, we are going to consider all the joint probability measures with known marginals, with known marginals, which are producing the correct price, or let's say, which is producing measures for these uh, sets within the bid ask spread, if you want to think about this in math finance terms. And then on the other hand side, we are going to consider all uh, all functions, so all trading strategies where you invest according to F1 up to FT in the marginals, and then you are investing according to this AI in this multi-asset digital options. So the outcome of the investment strategy is the sum of this one-dimensional integrals plus the sum of whatever you invest in uh, in the multi-asset digitals. Okay, and then you can show that there is a, that there is again duality between the supremum on this side and the infimum on this side. So since we have a lot enough time, uh, the proof of this result is not, uh, well, at least the way we did it, it does not follow the classical uh, uh, transport story. Uh, the way we did it is the following. I mean, you can start from the right-hand side. You can start from the right-hand side. And you can show that whatever you have on the right-hand side is a function which is convex increasing Uh, convex increasing, and then it has uh, some sort of path to property. Okay, so some good behavior in the limits, let's say. Well, but if you have some function psi, let's call it uh, psi of whatever, which has these properties, then you know that this has a dual representation. So this you can write as the supremum of uh, something like that minus some penalty term, which depends on the measure. Okay. So these are results that Michael Cooper and his group, they have proved to quite some generality. And then if you want to, to prove, uh, if you want to prove the duality, you just have to show that this penalty term is going to zero. Okay. And here you have some interplay between what are the properties of this measure that will send this quantity to zero. And yeah, this allows you to prove this result. And then you can also prove some generalizations of this result. So it's a very constructive proof, and you can really make assumptions here. And then if you can send it to zero, you get new dualities. OK, so if this is something interesting or not, then uh, but you have to judge later. OK, so one instance of this uh, uh, of this result that makes sense in mathematical finance is to assume short selling constraints. So to assume that you can only go uh, long in the derivatives and not short. Uh, in mathematics, this means that all the pay of functions and all the investment strategies are strictly positive. And then you can get the duality of the same form with the difference here that, uh, that you have some sort of uncertainty in the marginals in the sense that uh, you don't know exactly the marginal distributions, but they are dominated in, in whatever form by the non distribution functions mu1 to mu n. Okay, and then uh, there is a particular perk here that uh, you are not dealing exactly with probability measures, but you are losing some mass on the way. Okay, but this is the first instance where you get uncertainty in the dependent structure and uncertainty in the marginals. Okay, now uh, the duality results are interesting if you can solve uh, if you can solve the dual problem. 
right? If you cannot solve it, then what's the fun in that? And now, for a certain uh, for a certain specification, you can actually solve the dual problem for the functions that are of interest, which are like uh, you know indicators of boxes of this form. Okay, and the the solution has a well an, inti an intuitive geometric interpretation. So what you are really interested in doing is in geometric terms, you have some box B, and you are interested in, in covering this box by using either, um, you know, either horizontal strips or vertical strips or combinations of both. Uh, sorry, combinations of both, and then you can also use other boxes. So geometrically, it is easy to see that, you know, you can cover this by taking a horizontal strip of this form. You can cover this by taking a vertical strip of this form, or you can use one box. Okay, you can use one box which has whatever form and then cover the rest by another strip. But it is never optimal to use two boxes because, um, yeah, uh, this is, well, if this is your, um, your box B and you use two other boxes to cover this, then you have some region which is covered twice and you have some region which is not covered at all. So you would then use a strip either like that or like that to cover this and then somehow your hedging strategy becomes more costly without uh, producing a, a nice outcome. Okay, so there exists some case where you can solve this explicitly and then, uh, okay, it takes some thought, but then you will see that this is, uh, this is actually the improved pressure hefting bounds. Okay, so like that you can uh, you have a, you have a sharpness result for the improved crochet hefting bounds in the class of uh, well of joint distributions with uncertainty in the marginals. Okay, so you can prove some sharpness result for certain classes, and then uh, Stefan Eckstein uh, created a very nice result that shows that uh, if you fix the marginals, then uh, in higher, then this is typically not point by sharp unless you have some strict conditions. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, okay, and then as a final application, you can uh, you can try to revisit the previous result of uh, computing bounds for option prices, and now you can try to compute the same bounds using uh, this optimal transport results and some. Uh, some work that Eckstein and Cooper did on using uh, uh, using neural networks for computing the bounds. The outcome is not very favorable for this method. So what you observe from these pictures is that uh, this is again the reference price. This continuous green line, for example, is the improved fresh hefting bound, and the line you have here is uh, is the solution from the transport problem. But I think this is uh, due to I mean, you have these continuous functions that you are trying to approximate by neural networks, and this does not seem to be working very well. Okay. In principle, this is the solution to the SAR problem, and it should be better than the improved bound. Okay. Now, what is the problem still here? The problem still here is, uh, is that the information you are adding is of this type, that you know the, that you know the value of, uh, you know the value of the measure at some, uh, at some point in the domain. Okay, so uh, if you try to sell this as a, as a math finance novelty, you know, you will get uh, smart people like Julien Gouillon in the audience that say, well, you know, <laughs> this you typically don't know. You cannot observe from market data. Then you say, well, yes, but if I have a multi-asset option, I can invert it and then I get it. And then, well, in theory, there should be a map that takes the price and maps it to one point, uh, uh, that maps it to the measure of one point in the domain, but uh, well, in practice, good luck, you cannot do it. Okay, so, yeah. For the previous plot, for the continuous, you have like the, the bounce is not uh, mm -hmm. what you have expected. So, did you try to smoke in the tricks? I mean, for the indicator function that you have to see ah. if it helps in the neural network to work? Uh, no, but this is a good observation we can discuss later. Okay, so you know the outcome was that in the end, uh, again, you have something which is nice, but uh, not completely nice because uh, things in mathematical finance would not work that way. 
Okay, so the last part of the talk, uh, it will be joint work with Ariel Neufeld and Shi Kung Xiang, and this is something which is really model-free, data-driven, and taking into account the things that are known in the markets and nothing else. So no assumption on the marginals, no assumption in the joint distribution. So what we assume is that uh, we can observe traded prices for stocks, for single and multi-asset derivatives, and then we know their prices or we know their bid ask spreads, whatever you like. Okay, and then G denotes any payoff function from, uh, from RD to R, single dimension or multiple dimensional, and then we take things like trading the asset, trading a call option, trading a basket option, and so on into account. And now we want to populate the measure of, uh, we want to populate the set of probability measures by taking uh, this information into account. So how do we take them into account? We, as, we will use all the probability measures that are producing uh, the correct prices or prices within the bid ask spread for a given payoff function GI. And we are going to do this for the marginal distribution and also for the joint law. Okay, so uh, the only measures that are allowed in our set are the measures that are producing correct prices for observed, uh, for observed options for single assets and for, for multiple assets. Okay, so here, this is really data driven. If you observe something, you will put it in your measure. If you don't observe it, you don't make any assumption about that. Okay, so, uh, well, obviously then the target will be to take uh, the supremum or the infimum of the target payoff function with respect to this measure. And then you would like to have a duality and then on the other side, you should have a trading strategy. And the trading strategy will contain, uh, yeah? yeah. Right. Um, if I understand correctly, this is the static situation. So you consider all the options are for one single maturity. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, yeah, thank you, Christian, for the clarification. So, um okay so on uh, well on the right hand on the other hand side you will need the trading strategy and the trading strategies you know trading trading according to this uh, well this function this is just a vector for trading you know the bid price and the ask price and then so here you are going to take the infimum over c so a constant denotes you know trading in uh, in the bank account and then the rest is trading in the different assets. And then obviously you have still the same dominating condition that uh, you know trading in the bank account plus trading in this different payoff function should dominate your target payoff F. Okay, so here we can prove a uh, super hedging duality and then we can also prove a fundamental theorem of asset pricing here, which tells you that the infimum that you have here for this, uh, for this trading strategies is equal to the supremum of uh, of this payoff function with respect to the given probability measures. Okay. Uh, okay, the difference here is that uh, we are no longer dealing with functions, we are really dealing only with vectors. Okay, so here a trading function is not, uh, a trading strategy is not a function, it is really just a vector of trading some price. So now we can uh, formulate this problem as a linear semi infinite problem in this form. Okay, so this is your uh, your target and this are your, your constraints. And the aim is to develop numerical methods for computing the upper and lower bounds, which are uh, epsilon optimal in the following form. So uh, you should be able to bound this quantity above uh, by something and below by something. And the difference between these two bounds should be controlled by some epsilon. Okay, uh, the way to achieve this is uh, to focus on the class of, uh, of functions which are... Uh, continuous and piecewise are fine. So the, the definition is, is like that. So all your functions should be of this form, but this is not really restrictive. So you can put call options in this, uh, in this class. You can put basket options in this class. You can put everything that is written down here, spread, uh, colon, max, and so on. And the only thing you are excluding is, uh, for example, digital options. Okay. And then we have developed two methods for solving this problem. The one is called the exterior cutting plane method. Uh, so the cutting plane method is something uh, something known in the operations research uh, 
literature, and then here we have some exterior cuts that are enforcing this method. So the assumption is the following. We assume that the domain is, is bounded. We take functions f and then everything else g, which are of this continuous piecewise affine. And then what this algorithm is doing, it is basically uh, discretizing the domain by a growing, uh, by a growing subset. And then you are solving the inner problem by a mixed integer linear programming method. And what you can produce is you can produce uh, epsilon optimal solutions, which is uh, the optimal trading strategy. And uh, if you wish, you can even characterize the optimizer, but this is not uh, something useful for applications. Okay, so let's go to numerical experiments. So you have numerical experiments in the article, at least in dimensions five and in dimension 60. In dimension five, we assume that we have uh, 439 traded options. In the other, we have 400 of different types, like assets, uh, vanilla calls, baskets, and so on. And then in the five dimension, we want to uh, we want to produce upper and lower bounds on this payoff function. And then we have uh, we have different levels of information that we take into account. So the V means that you only take vanillas for the marginals. V plus B means that you take vanillas plant baskets. Here you take uh, spread options, and then you're also adding this type of options in the dom uh, in the mix. And uh, this is exactly of the same type as this payoff function, and this plays a role. Okay, so the numerical results looks as follows. This picture is a little bit condensed. Uh, if you look here at this uh, magnification, what you see is Sorry. So here it's a numerical experiment as uh, as it was done before, right? You assume some model for the asset. You assume some dependent structure in this model. You compute the additional information using this model, and then you throw everything away. And you just keep the prices, and then you compute the bounds, bounds based on these prices. So again, this uh, this uh, black and uh, sorry, where is this? So I think the reference prices are this one and this one. Uh, yes, I think these are the reference prices. And then everything else is the bounds you are computing using your method. OK, and then what you see is that as you are adding more information, you are getting bounds which are sharper and sharper. OK, so this is, for example, the upper bound if you use only marginal information on the marginals. Here you get a tighter bound if you add baskets, and even a tighter bound if you add uh, spread options. And where you get uh, really close is uh, if you use, uh, if you use uh, uh, this column max. OK, so the, the morale here is the following. If you add, uh, I mean, the more information you are adding, the narrower you are making the no arbitrage gap or you know the, the difference between upper and lower bounds. But then the structure of the additional information is important. OK, so once you add this, uh, this rainbow options, you see that the gap is really closing. Uh, while if you take this away, you have tighter bounds, but not really as tight as before. OK, so second numerical experiment is, uh, is using uh, some real data. So, what you can find that resembles somehow, you know, traded uh, multi-asset options is uh, some index. So we take uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This com uh, consists of 30 assets. So you have traded prices. So you have, you know, the asset, you have uh, options on the asset. And then you have uh, this DITF, which is like a basket option on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you collect all this information in the data. Uh, if you're going to ask it is something like uh, 4,000 something option prices that you can observe and then you can take into account. And then you go on and compute, uh, you know, the, you're going on and compute the, the bounce on the, the bounce on, uh, on some artificial payoffs that are, okay, let's say not by F1 and F2, you can find the details in the paper. Okay, and then what we are doing here is we are computing bounds where we increase the set of uh, the set of information that we have. So 25% means that we take uh, only one quarter of the data randomly selected. 50% is that you take half, and then you take everything on the marginals, and then you also add 
the basket. And then you see that the more information you are adding, the tighter you are making the bounds. And then in particular, again, using uh, information on the baskets is making things really tight. Okay, so uh, I think this is the uh, this is the upper bound if you use the baskets, and this is the lower bound if you use the baskets. They would be more or less the same if you took you know 25% of the marginals plus these baskets. Okay, so always the morale is that you know if you take a payoff which is similar to your target payoff, you are really getting a sharp bounce. Okay, I think my time is almost up. And uh, yeah, these are the, the yeah. So the yeah, these are the papers from this talk. So these are the words with Thibault about the uh, bounds on copulas and their applications. Uh, this is a paper with Paolo about detecting arbitrary opportunities. This is the optimal transport stuff, and uh, the final part was so the data-driven stuff is joint work with Ariel and Sikun. So that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This is really interesting. Um, in the last example, I didn't quite get. I mean, so you're, you're computing uh, an index option, right? Or an in um, you take data from the indices. So you take uh, the Dow Jones index, and you mm -hmm. have the. So the ETF is like a basket option on the index. Yes. Okay. And so then you create your artificial. I mean, in order to test things, you just create some artificial payoffs, which are basket type payoff functions. Okay, and and then you are computing bounds for this for these two artificial payoffs. And these artificial, I mean, what's the difference between the target option that you're trying to compute and the baskets that you include as additional information? The structure of the payoff is different. Okay. So here. I don't remember where exactly, but here you take, for example, you weight the, the asset by the capitalization, or you do some tricks to mm -hmm. have something which is slightly different from uh, okay. from the given payoff. Okay, thank and you. You could also do the, the given payoff, like the the DITF payoff, but then it would be, you know, the method would look too good. <laughs> Uh, how can copulas uh, be used to bound the value at risk? Um, uh, so you mean this part here? Um, I mean, the value at risk is something like uh, it is something like a digital option on the sum of your different components, and then, uh, well, I mean, you know, you are going to model the the, uh, the dependence between uh, the different components by a copula, right? This is a classical result, and then what we are saying is that you can use uh, our improved fresh hefting bounds and put them in this computation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somehow the, the computations of value at risk depend on the joint distribution between the different components, and then well, you can you know then you can put this improved bounds in this mix somehow. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, so, so I have a question. And the last plus uh, and other, I think. Um, it seems that the bounds are sensitive to the strike. Um, at, I mean, at, at the strike value. Any intuition? I mean, why the bounds? I mean, for instance, I mean, for low strike, you have tight bounds and with respect to uh, your reference um, value. But then um, you have, I mean, 
larger larger gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good question, thank you. But well, hmm. let's put it like this: if you're given a, if you're given a payoff, uh, well, in the limit. Uh, as the strike goes to zero to infinity, you would be able to compute the, the price even uh, without assuming any model. So you would have some asymptotics about the option price, which would not really depend on the model. And this is somehow uh, depicted by the fact that, uh, you know, as you go to this asymptotic limit, then, uh, you know, the, the actual information does not play any role. So I think the, you know, the most interesting is uh, is the area around the strike, you know, around the aftermath.